Recording technology and art have had a curious relationship. As soon as we discovered capture mediums like photography, sound recording, and motion pictures, we became obsessed with documenting the world around us. And with that obsession came the desire for ever more accurate recording techniques and mediums. The search for a perfect reflection of ourselves. As technology evolved, more players got into the game and an art world arms race was born. Vinyl records were replaced by magnetic tape, film stocks were imbued with color and increasing resolution. Anamorphic lenses squeezed as much life as possible into the available celluloid. Various techniques cropped up to compensate or eliminate imperfections and distortions and create a record more accurate to what we saw or heard. Towards the turn of the last century, something curious happened. As digital technology matured, we achieved pristine audio recordings that eliminated the wow and the flutter of running a needle over a vinyl record. Following right behind was film, with crisp digital sensors that eliminated grain, bloom, and gate weave from moving pictures and photographs. And just as that, perfect reflection was within our grasp, after many decades of pursuit, we decided we don't want it anymore. It's too cold, we've said. Too clinical, too real. Do you remember The Hobbit at 48 frames per second? I cannot guarantee his safety. Understood. Nor will I be responsible for his fate. And so we started a quest for ways to retain the low cost and convenience of a digital workflow while injecting back some of that warmth and romance and magic we associate with analog capture mediums. Why do we like these imperfections? You've been working out, haven't you? It may be that the image is inherently and objectively more pleasing, or it may simply be that it evokes the feeling of classic works of art and is only pleasing by association. This type of argument has been raging for many years over frame rates, focal lengths, anamorphics, and the classic film versus digital. Whatever the reason is, it's very likely that the argument is not dying anytime soon. One of the most quintessential tools for pleasing imperfections in the age of digital sensors is the diffusion or mist filter. Diffusion means that we are taking something concentrated and spreading it out. Diffusion filters disrupt and scatter light, resulting in a softer image, lower contrast, and a blooming effect around bright light sources. Such filters, when matched to modern optics, mimic and evoke vintage lenses, giving a more classic, expensive, and dare we say it, cinematic image. And it seems that there are some objectively good outcomes of diffusion. Skin appears smoother and younger. Bright lights are less harsh and less distracting, blooming out and falling off rather than stabbing the frame and distracting the viewer. While the image is smoother and therefore feels softer, a good diffusion filter will still retain a lot of detail, moving the image closer to the look many filmmakers are chasing, clarity without harshness. I was informed you were the most beautiful woman ever to visit Casablanca. That was a gross understatement. You're very kind. Despite their popularity in the digital age, diffusion filters weren't invented for digital sensors. And different forms of lens diffusions have been used for many decades. In the golden age of Hollywood, nets and Vaseline were used to soften skin and enhance beauty on actors. This is even a TV trope called Gaussian Girl, particularly popular in Star Trek, the original series. Vaseline has a fairly heavy effect and produces a more stylized, dreamlike image. But filmmakers soon realize that more subtle diffusion can provide pleasing effects without drawing attention. So diffusion or mist filters have a large range of duties from subtle, almost imperceptible shifts to full-blown fantasy land. And that range of duties is covered by their different strengths. Mist filters typically come in fractions, in multiples of one, from one eighth to a quarter to a half, then 
through one, two, and three, and even beyond. Although I never met anyone that used anything stronger than one. When you're watching film and narrative TV, you're seeing diffusion filters in action all the time. That callback to classic films makes these filters particularly suited to period pieces. For example, in the Coen brothers Inside Lewin Davis, or in The Crown and Peaky Blinders, which used glimmer glass for a subtle, subconscious call out to their time setting. Sheer perfection. It's also fairly obvious when a dream sequence or fantasy sequence is signposted by strong diffusion. See Harry Potter's death sequence in the Death Hollows part two, for example. This example was heavily manipulated in post-production though, just like inside Lewin Davis before someone calls me out on it. Yet, subtle diffusion is used in less remarkable scenarios too. Dexter is not a show we associate with fantasy or nostalgia, yet diffusion filters are used throughout. I never thought about it until I saw it. And now I can't unsee it. Because diffusion filters are so effective, there's a temptation to throw them on every shot. But like any other piece of gear, the tool should fit the task. For a gritty urban drama or a horror film, a harsher look might be preferred. If you're already using vintage lenses, they might already have a softer look and a lower contrast that makes a diffusion filter overkill. Tackling a question we got on Instagram, diffusion filters behave differently at different focal lengths. So it's appropriate to use different strengths depending on your lens's focal length, or to omit one entirely for a particular shot and rely on post-production techniques for matching this one shot to the rest. While they are not an automatic inclusion in a film kit, they are an incredibly useful tool that all filmmakers should consider experimenting with. There are tons of videos comparing different mist filters and their strengths, so we're not gonna do a lot of it here. To stay on topic with anamorphic shooting, I wanted to show some of the differences between using Nisi's mist filters along with the, oh my God, that's too sharp, Suray lenses. This entire episode is using these filters. We got a quarter strength on the 35 millimeters, that's the main camera, and a half strength on the 75 millimeters, that's the B cam. The other important thing to talk about is that there is a wide variety of diffusion filters. The classic ones are black and white mist, but what's the difference between black and white mist? How does each of those affect the resulting images? Researching for this episode, I came across the most gorgeous lens test ever by DIN Films, and it uses Nisi's black mist filters. And I was mesmerized watching this start to finish. So the idea of a mist filter is to soften up the image through scattering light. This leads to an overall lowered contrast, and that's what we get from the white mist filters. The black version has a layer of black specks on top of the regular scattering particles, which creates a subtler effect. If you compare the same filter strengths, you'll see that the black one is less pronounced. If you want a really thorough comparison on the subject, Nisi has a video with all their filter strengths on a controlled, repeatable environment. So the black mist filter holds contrast better, but that doesn't come without a cost. You can see the black specks showing up on the large bokeh circles. Just like fishing line for flare filters, many filters also create artifacts in the bokeh, like very fine grain or patterns. If you don't believe me, here's a little bit of the Queen's Gambit night, where you can night. see it Hardly in action. Notice the bokeh. So I shall say good night. Till it be if you have to walk away from this video with one witty thing to tell your cinematographer friends, is you can usually spot if a shot is filtered by looking at bokeh. Although these days one can easily add diffusion in post-production, you might be pressed for time or prefer to achieve your look in camera. For you, mist filters are a must. Some of its subtleties are also tricky to achieve in post if you're not a professional colorist. This Harry Potter sequence, for example, required tons of rotoscoping, tracking, and masking to achieve the desired look. <laughs> Ah, 
Computers and high resolution capture changed the game when it comes to image manipulation. This kind of stuff was impossible during the 90s and pretty inaccessible for the early 2000s. Opposite to it, the look of Goddess of Lens filter is super on point and it's mostly done in camera. Hollywood relied heavily on diffusion filters for several decades and these are still a pretty awesome tool. Check Nisi's Allure Mist Filter series to see what they got in stock and how it can best serve your needs. I had a blast developing this episode and it's good to try some stuff that is not directly anamorphic, especially in this case for how diffusion takes the edge off on the Suray lenses. If you got any questions or you wanna point out any mistakes I might've made, the comment section is all yours. Otherwise, just make sure to subscribe before you head out and stay tuned for more videos. Chitta Fahedings, out.